one, describe the induced fit model of enzyme action. So I'm just going to draw it out here. So we have an enzyme and the enzyme's got an active site. Really important. And we also have a substrate. Now, in the induced fit model of enzyme action, this substrate isn't actually completely complementary to the active site of the enzyme. However, it is able to bind to it. And when it binds, the shape of the active site actually changes shape. And that's when the enzyme substrate complex forms. But as an enzyme, of course, it needs to lead to a reaction somehow. And the reason that the reaction happens is because this actually stresses or distorts the bonds in the substrate. And this is what leads to a reaction. So I'm not going to bother writing out the answer there. I'll just show you the mark scheme. So there we have it. Three possible marking points. So the fact that the active site isn't complementary, but the shape does sh change and that distresses the bonds. That's all you need to know for the induced fit model of enzyme action. So the second part, they've given us a graph. They've investigated the hydrolysis of starch. They've added amylase to starch and then measured the concentration of maltose in the reaction mixture at regular intervals. So if we think about it, so they've got an enzyme here. So this is amylase. They've added starch to it and amylase has hydrolyzed starch into maltose. And here are the results. Um, so you can see over time, you're getting more and more maltose, but this is gradually plateauing off. They've asked you so far to determine the rate of reaction at 10 minutes and to show how you obtained your answer. So I've already done this here just to speed things up a bit. All you have to do is draw a tangent. A lot of students just pick a point at 10 minutes and divide the concentration by time. But we're looking at rate. So we draw a tangent and then work it out like that. So I found that was 300, 120, divided that by 17, and that gave me the answer, um, 10.58. Um, if we have a look at the mark scheme. So you get one mark for drawing a tangent, and then they've given you a range of values which you could have your answer in, depending on how you've drawn your tangent. Explain the results shown in figure four. So not describe, you have to actually explain why they are the way they are. So let's have a look at them again. So what are the results showing? Well, we can see that over time, the concentration of maltose is increasing. But actually, at the start, the concentration increases really rapidly, and then it plateaus off. And then actually, at this point, the concentration um, is completely plateaued. Plateau. can't spell that, um, completely plateaued and stopped increasing. So I guess the reaction has stopped. Um, but here it's really fast, the increase, so the rate, um, and here it's slowing. So before you go into answering this kind of question, just annotate it and make sure you've focused on all aspects of the graphs. But to actually get the marks here, we need to explain it. So I would start off at the start of the graph by saying initially the um, concentration of maltose increases rapidly because there's lots of starch and you form lots of enzyme substrate complexes and therefore hydrolyzing it into maltose. And then I would say in the next bullet point is over time the rate of reaction is slowing because we've got a finite amount of starch. So actually the substrate is being used up. And then after about 25 minutes, the graph is plateauing, the concentration of maltose stops increasing, and that's because all the substrate has been used up. And I would bullet point that there as three points. So let's just have a look at the mark scheme, confirm that. There we go. So we've talked about, um, so you could have said one of two things for the first point. The fact that it starts off high or that the rate of increase slows. But then, it really importantly, to get that second mark, which people often miss out on, is talking about what's happened at the end. Completing the story, if you like. 
And that's something, everyone thinks of enzyme graphs to be quite easy, but actually often lose out on easy marks. And that's because people don't fully explain the graph. So always make sure you've explained the start, the middle and the finish to guarantee that you've covered everything. Okay, the final part. Students found this really difficult, um, but it's not as hard as it seems. So let's have a read of it. A quantitative Benedict's test produces a colour whose intensity depends on the concentration of reducing sugar in a solution. A colorimeter can be used to measure the intensity of this colour. So that's just telling us what we already know about the Benedict's test. Now, the scientists have used this test to produce a calibration curve of colorimeter reading against concentration of maltose. Describe how the scientist would have produced the calibration curve and then used it to obtain the results in figure four, but do not include details of how to perform a Benedict's test in your answer. Now, the first thing that you should do when you're looking at this is identify, well, if it's not testing your knowledge of the Benedict's test, what could it be testing your knowledge of? And the students who did this really successfully actually identified that this was instead testing your knowledge of required practical three. The practical where you produce a dilution series of sucrose to then produce a calibration curve in order to identify the water potential of plant tissue. And this is very similar, in fact. So if we just remind ourselves of figure four. So, over, so we've got time and we've got concentration of maltose. So what they're doing at kind of every interval here, they're taking a bit of the solution out and they're finding the concentration of maltose, but they're doing that using the calibration curve. So our first part of our answer, if you like, is going to be talking about how we produce this calibration curve. And if we break it down like this, it's actually really not that difficult. So all we're going to do is we're going to use known concentrations of maltose. We're going to perform the Benedict's test on them. And we're going to calculate their absorbance in a colorimeter. OK, um, that's going to give you an absorbance value. And then once we've done that, we actually need to plot the calibration curve. It's just a graph, so we need to talk about the axes. Um, so produce a calibration curve. It's going to be concentration on the x-axis and absorbance or the colorimeter reading on the y-axis. So now we've covered the first part of our answer, so we can tick that off. But now in the second part, we need to say how we used it to obtain the results in figure four. So let's just draw it out hypothetically. So we've got concentration of maltose and absorbance. Let's say it looks something like this. And now what we do um, to obtain the results in figure four, so we said, let's take an example of at five minutes, we've performed the Benedict's test on it. So we've got a, an absorbance value, right? But we don't know the concentration. So actually what we're going to do is kind of read it off this graph. So say we've measured the absorbance to be here, you can almost read it backwards and find out the concentration from the graph. Find the concentration of the sample from our calibration curve. And hopefully you can see now it's really not as hard as it looked to start with. And they often do this kind of thing. They test your knowledge of something um, in an unfamiliar context and it does throw a lot of people off. So here's the mark scheme. Um, so make solutions of known concentrations. That's our first point. Then measure their reading and plot it on a graph. And then, um, so you could have mentioned the x and the y axes like we did. And then actually to find the maltose concentration of our samples to plot that curve at each time point, and that's our final point there.